Uh, good afternoon for those of you who are on Eastern time in the United States. On behalf of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy and the Alexandria Summit, I'd like to welcome all of you to today's webinar on developing and scaling COVID-19 vaccines. This is, this is really a big part of the ballgame for responding to the pandemic. And we're happy to have so many of you here with us today. This is actually the third in a series of webinars that we are going to continue doing on key issues related to the COVID-19 response efforts that contain and ultimately uh, defeat the pandemic. We focused previously on diagnostics and on uh, more effective and, and widespread testing, as well as on COVID-19 treatments. Uh, today, we're focusing in on the vaccination uh, aspect of the COVID-19 response. Uh, this is a topic that has garnered, understandably, an unprecedented amount of attention as part of the pandemic response with all of the sectors of healthcare and governments around the world working together and working hard on delivering on the hope of potential vaccines. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the key issues currently looking forward to getting to safe and effective vaccines as quickly as possible today. Uh, I'd like to start out by just showing an overview of the plan. This is modified a little bit from the agenda that we sent around previously. Uh, first, we'll be starting with a, a fireside chat with uh, with uh, um, the director of the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who's been a leader in the U.S. and global efforts to respond to the pandemic. Then we're going to have two panel discussions with people who are playing critical roles in the vaccination efforts uh, around in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, the first session is going to focus on accelerating COVID-19 vaccine candidates uh, and the strategies to support Support uh, rapid development at, at development at scale, uh, and then the second set section, the second panel, will focus on the scale and scope of challenges associated with manufacturing a vaccine that could be widely used uh, around the world to help with uh, containing and, and ultimately uh, re eliminating the threat of the pandemic. Uh, all of this is happening; uh, plans are happening at an unprecedented scale and scope. We're going to end with a special closing discussion with former commissioner, former FDA commissioner Scott Gottlieb. We'll reflect on what we've heard during the day and where we go from here. And I just want to emphasize to you all, we are going to be running a little bit longer than the scheduled time that we announced at the beginning. So if you're willing to stay with us, uh, we promise we'll make those last 15 minutes pretty interesting as well. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of logistical items. Uh, this webcast is being re recorded. It will be available on the Duke Margolis website after the event. Uh, all the participants are going to be muted during the duration of the event. We would very much like to hear from you and feed your comments and perspectives into the uh, live discussion that we're having. If you have a question or comment that you'd like to get to us, please tweet it. Uh, as you can see on the, the slide uh, here, uh, we'd like you to tweet to uh, COVID, hashtag COVID vaccine dev. Uh, if you have a comment or you'd like to just uh, uh, add to the discussion going on with us today. Okay, so uh, on to the next slide. Um, I want to talk about the unprecedented nature of the response that we're seeing because of the unprecedented nature of the pandemic. Uh, we are going to hear from a range of perspectives about the variety of platforms for vaccine development underway today. There are more than 100 candidates in development, including some new platform technologies like mRNA technologies, as well as some unique delivery systems and modifications to uh, vaccine approaches that are more tried and true, where we have platforms with more extensive records of safety and delivering on uh, vaccines in, in other contexts. Uh, but the novel platforms present some new opportunities, such as being able to get into large-scale production faster. Uh, they also create some opportunities for having a multiple shot on goal approach to, to dealing with the pandemic. They present some special issues as well. So we're going to try to discuss a range of the types of vaccine platforms. But as you know, it's not just around, it's not just about the issue of developing the, the platforms and maybe getting them into clinical testing, but there's a whole pathway. And on the next slide, uh, we talk about some of the key issues in uh, getting to 
getting from promising vaccine candidates to large scale availability of safe and effective vaccine treatments. Uh, first of all, there is a lot going on in the United States and around the world around prioritizing and advancing promising candidates and providing a very clear path, parallel paths all the way through to uh, availability at scale uh, around the world. Uh, in the United States, for example, the, uh, the uh, BARDA has identified about a dozen or so candidates that are getting some extra help and being assisted in advancing uh, through this process. Uh, other governments and large uh, privately led foundations, collaborative efforts are also helping along this process, which involves some unprecedented collaborations across uh, regulatory agencies around the world and manufacturers and, uh, uh, and government leaders. Uh, second key issue is enhancing the capacity to do clinical testing. Uh, vaccines, unlike treatments for people who have COVID-19, particularly with serious complications, are going to be delivered to people who are largely healthy. They may be at risk for complications like the elderly or like frontline healthcare workers, uh, but that means that more testing is needed uh, so that we have a good understanding of safety issues that are not as important for patients, especially who have who are experiencing serious complications. Uh, at the same time, vaccines require people to mount an immune response. Uh, they're, they're not uh, treatments that are effective right when they're given. And that means some time to observe that immune response and to observe how that immune response uh, for a new, vac for a new uh, uh, illness like this one, how that immune response actually translates into the ability to resist or reduce the severity of a COVID-19 infection. So clinical trials for vaccines typically take a while for that reason, to enroll uh, patients who are at risk and may be hard to find them if an if a, a outbreak is well controlled by the time the vaccines are developed and to see if, if people are able to mount this sufficient uh, response, a sufficient immune response without serious safety issues. At the same time, vaccines are also going to be delivered, in this case, a particularly large population. So being able to uh, address some manufacturing and distribution at population scale, especially for a pandemic like this one, which is truly unprecedented in, in many respects, uh, is a major manufacturing and distribution challenge. In fact, one of the distinctive features of the entire COVID-19 pandemic has been the challenge of scaling at every single step, uh, from the early surge responses to uh, testing the capabilities now. And we need to anticipate those same kinds of issues coming up with finding adequate ways to do clinical testing and adequate ways to support manufacturing and distribution. And then finally, just like other treatments for unmet medical needs, there will be a lot of pressure to make vaccines that look very promising in their clinical evidence available more widely uh, to uh, people, especially those at highest risk, like frontline healthcare workers. One can imagine uh, if a vaccine shows a very significant promise uh, during an early look uh, that there would be a pathway for emergency use. And even when vaccines are approved, there will be a lot more to learn about which vaccines, if we have multiple options, work best and on different kinds of groups, optimal dosing issues, understanding safety problems better, uh, understanding the extent and duration of immunity, lots of questions that we'll need to develop further evidence on through actual use uh, in the real world as these vaccines become available if they do demonstrate safety and effectiveness. So lots of issues that are distinct here, and these are why it often takes a long time for vaccine development. But again, the difference here is that we're not talking about a vaccine for a condition that uh, is, is well controlled or is likely to be well controlled in the months ahead. We're not talking about a condition where there is a, a limited market and, and a limited uh, uh, potential for uh, economic recovery for the uh, manufacturers and others involved. We're talking about a pandemic that is, infected, that is affecting the entire world uh, and having an impact on the health of of, of millions, the lives of billions around the world, and the economic uh, uh, productivity of our entire planet in a, in a largely unprecedented way. So for all of those reasons, we are seeing uh, uh, something happen here that really hasn't happened uh, before. And if you go on to the next slide, I just wanna quickly go through um, the, uh, some key points about the vaccine response 
uh, today for COVID-19 that is maybe different uh, and is leading to uh, a lot of uh, expectations that will be able to significantly accelerate the process. This is not happening because people are significantly reducing the standards for, for safety and effectiveness of a vaccine candidate. It's happening because a lot of steps that usually take place sequentially are happening in parallel uh, and to the extent possible are overlapping. So as I mentioned, a clear regulatory pathway and a clear development pathway, a clear clinical development pathway is happening because of activities underway at NIAID and collaborators in the U.S. government and, and around the world. So vaccine manufacturers know exactly what's needed at every step of the process. And where possible, steps are being combined. Uh, studies of effectiveness in animal models are happening at the same time that phase one studies are being set up and implemented to uh, assess safety uh, uh, and uh, other key issues uh, in human testing. Uh, phase two, phase one, phase two studies are likely to overlap. We'll see some potential opportunities for moving uh, directly into uh, phase three uh, testing uh, from, pro from promising results in the earlier trial designs by setting up platforms and by planning ahead for having availability of populations who can be studied in areas where there are significant outbreaks, even though we don't know exactly where those are going to be uh, in the months ahead. And while that clinical testing and clinical development is taking place, uh, we're not waiting to work on the manufacturing and distribution issue. So uh, you've heard a lot, and we'll talk more today about steps that are underway to build large-scale manufacturing capacity and to start actual production, not because we're sure we're going to use the vaccines that come out of this testing process. We don't know what the results of the clinical trials are yet, but just so we have that large-scale availability of vaccine doses to help have a major impact on the pandemic right at the time when the treatments are approved, when those clinical studies are done and the, and the rapid and, and re regulatory review subject to these well-worked-out standards uh, takes place. I, again, would even expect to see some potential significant emergency use authorization uh, before uh, that those final regulatory decisions are made if an early look at some of these vaccine trials suggests a significant impact and there's, again, considerable pressure for availability. So lots of things happening at once and also uh, in the post-market setting, again, lots of will need to be learned as the uh, vaccines become more widely available if they are safe and effective. So with that framing, I'd like to turn to our uh, first guest. I'm very pleased to have uh, with us today um, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Uh, Tony Fauci has uh, got to be one of the world's uh, busiest people uh, today, uh, and uh, I, I think many of you have seen him not only regularly, but as recently as yesterday, uh, talking about the, uh, that the federal government's uh, strategic plan on vaccine development, among other topics, and uh, congressional hearings. So, uh, uh, Tony, very glad to have you on with us. Uh, thanks for being here today. It's good to be with you, Mark. Thank you for having me. Um, I was listening uh, in on your presentation, which was really spot on. You know, I think uh, it really led into what will be, will be our brief discussion now, because there are certain points that you made that are really very important, particularly doing things simultaneously in parallel, the idea about production at risk, all the kinds of things that we don't generally do in a, in a, in a vaccine trial. But I'd be happy to discuss anything that you want during this period. But I, I do want to make one point, if you'll allow me, because you mentioned the idea about emergency use authorization and, and um, how sometimes people get confused about what that really means. We right now have with multiple candidates, and, and I don't know whether any of you have seen, but Larry Corey, John Muscola, and Francis Collins and I wrote a commentary in science that came out like two days ago called A Strategic Approach to COVID-19 Vaccine R&D. And you're probably going to hear more about that. I understand looking at your calendar that you have Peter Marks will be on very soon anyway. You know, and I was just on a phone call with, with Peter talking about some of the things that I just want to bring up very briefly because I know we don't have a lot of time. Right now, we need to have coordinated um, vaccine trials of different candidates that are done in a way that they complement each other. 
so that you have things that are commonalities vis-a-vis uh, things that are maybe harmonization of the protocols, laboratory data that are really consistent from, from, from study to study, uh, how one puts together a DSMB to sort of make sure you get the right questions and the right answers there. But importantly, is that we will have cases either in the United States, which we do right now. I mean, if you look at the curve of the cases, I mean, we have active infection in the United States. So we should be able to get a definitive, quick safety and efficacy response with a typical classical randomized placebo controlled trial. Now, whenever you have an emergency where people want to get things out there, they immediately say, oh, just give me animal data, give me some immunogenicity, see if it's safe. And then what you wind up having is something we really need to avoid is the perpetual ambiguity of does this really work or not? We need to nail that down. And you could once, as you said, and I like the way you said it, Mark, that you may get a signal that's an efficacy signal in a classical controlled trial that doesn't nail it down completely, but strongly indicates that you're going to get a vaccine efficacy signal. Then you might want to use an emergency use authorization to get healthcare workers done. But I would be really, really concerned if we wound up at the end of this without any definitive trials that truly show it's safe and effective. So I would hope in all the discussions that we have that we don't let go of that core fundamental issue. Anyway. And and, uh, Tony, that, and that really is the key point of that science article that uh, you authored uh, this week. I'd recommend it to everyone who's on our webinar. It's a great overview of how to do exactly what Tony said, uh, moving forward with multiple shots on goal, getting clinical trials done as quickly as possible by all of this planning ahead while manufacturing is taking place. So Tony, if you could expand a little bit on what you see as, as the, the critical challenges going forward. Where are we now um, in executing on this vision? Uh, what are you going to be most concerned about in, in the weeks ahead? Yeah, in the weeks ahead, what, what, I, what I'm, I, I wouldn't say concerned, but certainly is a consideration to make sure that we don't have some of the things that all of us have experienced in vaccine development, a glitch that sets us back two weeks. You know, <laughs> For those of us who've been doing vaccines for for years, it's usually a long range thing. You know, it takes years and years. So a week here or there or a month here or there doesn't make that much difference. We don't have that much time. We have got to do things safely in a measured way, but we got to move really quickly. We can't let something that sits on somebody's desk for five days when it should have been done in 15 minutes We can't let that happen. So I'm going to be like a hawk (laughs) to the extent that I can to make sure that doesn't happen. But also we've got to make sure that we do things in a, in a, in somewhat of an interdigitating collaborative way. I mean, companies want to get to the goal line first. I just want vaccines to get to the goal line. I don't care who gets credit for it. We've got to get a safe and effective vaccines, plural. We want multiple shots on goal, but we want multiple goals. <laughs> that's the point. We don't want to be one goal and the game is over. And, and that's what I think that we need to do. We need to get a new mindset to do that. Yeah. I think we're going in that direction, Mark. I do. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of some of those key parallel paths, uh, you mentioned the clinical development and avoiding glitches in um, the, the trial process. And I understand that NIH is mobilizing a lot of its clinical networks. Uh, FDA is working with the uh, uh, private sector that uh, private sector networks that it often works with. Can you say a little bit more about how you're going to make sure we have that uh, clinical trial capacity and some redundancies built in there and the ability to bring a number of these compounds forward potentially at the same time? Okay, great question. So some of you may know that a few decades ago in the late 80s, I built a network of clinical trials, AIDS clinical trial group, prevention trial network, vaccine trial network. We also have the influenza networks. We have tuberculosis networks. That's only an NIAID. We also have other institutes at NIH, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute that also has networks. 
If you do that and, and supplement it with CROs when needed, I think we could have a network that really plays, you know, inter, interdigitating with each other in a way that we could get it done. And if, and, and if we need more, we can supplement it, but we already have in place the networks that we want to start keeping them warm now for the next couple of months. And by warm, I mean getting them involved in testing. We need the CDC to give us surveillance data as to where we need to be for the vaccine trial. Why not use those networks as the foci of what you're doing the testing in? I mean, that's very simple. Who cares if it was built as an AIDS network? I mean, we don't want to put AIDS aside, but we have an acute problem right now. So that's what I've committed to do, Mark, to get any network, no matter what it was originally built for, to get involved in this. Mm -hmm. And you also are not waiting to build the production capacity. Maybe we could say a little bit more about plans there. Um, not only do you need uh, large scale manufacturing for the vaccines themselves to have a really significant impact on the pandemic here in the U.S. and globally, um, but you also need some of the supporting capacities, the vials and so forth that are needed for distribution, uh, and you need to make sure that there are multiple uh, plants available. As you said, you know, a glitch that you don't want is a, a problem in production, uh, in a production line at, at one plant. How is that going? Well, you know, it's not going yet, mm -hmm. but it's going to go really fast. So I'm, and all of us are in a very unusual situation. Um, generally, we have to scrap and fight for a little bit of money here and a little bit of money there. This is a very interesting window. People are throwing money at us. So what we need to do is that we need to proceed at risk with everything. We need to make things that we may never have to use. We need to build things that we need to never have to use. And that's really the epitome of at risk. Not only do we need the facilities to do it, but we got to start making doses at the time that we're transitioning from phase one into phase two, three. We've never done that before, but we've got to do it. And I've explained that to the legislators, you know, the people who are being generous enough to give mm -hmm. us the money that we may be wasting. I wouldn't say wasting because it's investing. Uh, we may be investing in things that we may not ever use. And that may be to the tune of a half a billion to a billion or more dollars right off the bat. Mm -hmm. So they're aware of that. And I think they buy into that. Yeah, I, I think so uh, as well. And in terms of learning more about, about that, these vaccines after they're on the market, so taking uh, um, the opportunities to use electronic data, other uh, sources of information to refine our understanding, you, know, you emphasize that you'd like to have multiple candidates available. Um, I assume there's some, there are going to be some more things to learn after we start um, vaccinating uh, higher, at least higher risk groups. Uh, as this process goes forward, if there are safe and effective vaccines? Oh, oh, well, absolutely. I mean, it isn't as complicated as we don't have a vaccine. Now we have a vaccine. It's going to be, we've shown efficacy now. What about children? What about the elderly? What about people on immunosuppressive drugs? Globally, what about the developing world? Is the vaccine and the vaccine dose here the same as in a country where half the kids have malaria and parasitic disease. I mean, we've gotten burned before with vaccines like rotavirus vaccines that are not particularly effective in a certain subgroup of people in the developing world. Those are all considerations that are post-vaccine efficacy studies that we need to do. So let's just, let's just get that shot on goal and get that puck in that net, and then we could take off from there. And those are what you're referring to, I think, are post-approval, post-development studies, yeah. which we have to make an investment in doing. Yeah. Tony, I know how incredibly busy your schedule is. We've got a, a couple of minutes or so left. I wanted to maybe broaden the lens a little bit. You've talked about how this is a, a truly unprecedented 
pandemic in, in many ways. And, and you've kind of seen it all, starting with uh, all kinds of, uh, starting with AIDS, but uh, many uh, public health emergencies and crises. We had the chance to, to work together on the, you know, the 9-11 anthrax bioterrorism response on SARS, on other issues. You've seen more since then. Could you say, just maybe put this in perspective from the standpoint of your broad career, uh, how does this shape up? And especially looking forward for, um, you know, at Duke, we've got some new uh, doctors and graduates going into training around the world. There are healthcare leaders that are hoping we can come out of this doing things differently. Um, any advice for how this fits in the uh, broader development of or, or broader progress in, in dealing with public health crises and, and what our healthcare leaders should be thinking about? Right. Good question, Mark. And I get asked it often. Uh, you know, it's one of those things that if you happen to be in a situation like I am through no fault or good thing of my own, that I've been doing this for a very long period of time. Uh, there are certain commonalities in outbreaks. They have certain characteristics. I mean, if you look at HIV AIDS, it was something that started almost below the radar screen. We saw the tip of the iceberg. And then all of a sudden, over decades now, we probably are gonna have more people who are gonna be impacted. 78, 80 million people have gotten infected. 37 million have died. We have 36 million people living with HIV. That's a big time. But it is really, really different to have an outbreak that goes from nothing that we could recognize in early January to just three and a half months, four months later to do what it's doing to our society, to tell the young people who are getting involved in public health that you have essentially begun to cut your teeth in a completely unprecedented historic outbreak. And I think in some respects that can be intimidating, but in certain respects, I would hope that the people who are getting involved in this see that as very challenging because we are having to do things that no other public health officials have done. I mean, if you go back to 1918, they got hit by a really, really bad pandemic. They didn't have any of the resources really that we have. Now we're getting hit acutely over a period of months with something that's destroying the economy of the world, at the same time we're trying to respond in a, in a responsible way from a public health standpoint, no one has ever been in a position that our current generation has been in. I can tell you for sure, you know, and in the 40 years that I've been doing it, none of my colleagues have either. So this is, you know, we, we, we bank on our experience but a lot of this is uncharted, absolutely uncharted. So we've got to be creative, but we also got to accept the challenge. I mean, this is an amazing challenge. Yeah. Uh, Tony, um, you said yesterday that you were cautiously optimistic about the outlook for, for vaccines. Um, I'd say based on your comments, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic not only about that, but about our potential for really rising to this challenge and, and building a better capacity to respond to, uh, to future epidemics and public health emergencies. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Good luck. I'll talk to you right, soon. Thank I'm you. sure we'll see a lot of you. each other. Take care. As well, that's right. All right. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Tony. We're going to go straight into our first panel now. Remember, we're going to have a dialogue with Scott Gottlieb at the end of our second panel. It's at 2.25. Uh, but right now, we've got a, a great panel ahead on vaccine development. Uh, we're going to focus here on that set of issues related to moving these very promising compounds forward as quickly as possible and determining uh, whether they really are safe and effective and along the way uh, trying to uh, get the production capacity up too. Uh, we've got a great group of uh, participants to discuss these topics, uh, including Adrian Hill from the Jenner Institute and Oxford Martin Program on vaccines, uh, one of the leading uh, vaccine candidate uh, developers, Tal Sachs uh, from Moderna Therapeutics, uh, working on a leading uh, mRNA vaccine, uh, John Reed from Sanofi, uh, also a different type of vaccine platform that is moving forward into 
production uh, or into clinical testing and, and production. And then Peter Marks, who is uh, uh, Tony Fauci mentioned, uh, at the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research at the FDA is right at the center of the, the regulatory processes and this convergence across public and private efforts to make this clinical development pathway go as, effect, go as efficiently as possible to uh, determining safety and effectiveness and supporting uh, large-scale availability of safe and effective vaccines. Um, I'd like to start off by going to Adrian, uh, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, Adrian, you've uh, been at this for a while and are actually working on a vaccine that's in uh, clinical testing now, a really kind of remarkable pace, but I don't think it happened by accident. Uh, uh, can you talk a little bit about how you got to where you are and, and, and what's going on uh, with the, the Oxford work, including the, the AstraZeneca collaborations and the like. Sure. Well, thank you for asking me. Um, I should say as a preface that I'm representing a team of five principal investigators here. Um, Sarah Gilbert, who was heavily involved in designing and making this vaccine back in January. Uh, Teresa Lamb, who's been doing a lot of preclinical work, some of that is on bioarchive today in, uh, in non-human uh, primates. Andrew Pollard, our chief investigator of the current clinical trial. And Sandy Douglas, who's been leading on scaling up this vaccine, not the sort of thing that you normally do in a university setting, uh, but he's taken that on and working with AstraZeneca now for the last two weeks, that's getting, getting really uh, exciting. Okay, can I show some slides or would that work? I Shall think I so, we can do it quickly. There's a, should be, if, if you can, there's a, should be a button at the bottom for sharing your screen. Absolutely, yeah, let's, so let's do that. Mm -hmm. I can share screen, okay, right. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Great. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about a chimpanzee adenoviral vector vaccine. We've been working on these for nearly 20 years now. We started off with Hildegund Ertel as a collaborator in uh, Wistar, who'd been working with Jim Wilson, who was using them as gene therapy vectors. And they've been around uh, a little while now. Uh, let me give you a background. This is basically an adenovirus, like something that's infected all of you. But the difference is this one circulates in chimpanzees and not humans, and that's not accidental because we want to have a vector that humans do not have significant immunity to, and that is the case. But otherwise, it's a regular adenovirus. If I showed you the sequence, you wouldn't be able to tell. It's from a chimpanzee. We put in an antigen under a very strong CMV promoter. It's expressed very powerfully. And in a region where taking out the adenoviral gene stops it replicating. So it's a non-replication vector, highly uh, safe. It's been in several hundred people, this particular Chad Ox1 vector. But the same sort of vaccine, uh, chimpanzee vectors as a whole, have been in over 6,000 people since 2007. We did the first uh, clinical trial right then. So what was happening back in January when the Wuhan outbreak happened was that Sarah Gilbert was improving technology, as she does, particularly these viral vectors. She had a rapid manufacturing method for adenovectors that was actually likely to be more useful, we thought, in cancer vaccine or personalized vaccine development than in outbreak pathogens. But she had a go at this uh, then a very little known Wuhan virus now. SARS-CoV-2 <coughs> made a vector and, uh, and kept going. So I'll skip that one. Why were we using CHAD vectors? They nearly always work as a single dose for outbreak pathogens. They have this safety record in 6,000 people. You can manufacture them pretty easily in a HEC293 cell line, a generic available cell line. We were working on them 10, 15 years ago, not for antibody induction, because that, but because they're CD8 T cell inducing vectors. And we actually think the T cell response to COVID is as important as the neutralizing antibody response. You get good neutralizing titers as well. And of course, Sarah had already done clinical trials with a vaccine based on CHADOX1 for MERS. Now, MERS is Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, the only other coronavirus prevalent at the moment that causes disease and prevalent in Saudi Arabia, had a big Korean outbreak as well. 
And we knew that we could scale up these vectors and they're very similar to human vectors being developed by say Janssen, or you'll hear about those later, I believe. You can use the vector twice, ideally after six months to a year rather than a month later when it doesn't work so well. So you do need that, that interval. And there are lots of increasing numbers of CHAD vectors becoming available. So in mice, we quickly showed that you could get a, a T cell response, that's an early spot, 2,000 spots per million, uh, different strains of mice, and good antibody titers. And we now know those are neutralizing antibodies. We know that in non-human primates, if you challenge these animals, as Vincent Munster's group did at Rocky Mountain Labs, you get very good efficacy in six out of six animals. Could we manufacture this? And as you've alluded to, if you can't manufacture quickly and at scale, that just is not gonna be useful for this, this outbreak. So we had experience of doing this in our little university manufacturing facility where we could make maybe a thousand doses. We'd made 17 chimp vectors before this outbreak. So we stopped everything, started going again. The vector got into the GMP facility very quickly manufactured from March to April and filled, as it says there, in the middle of April. We were trying to do this as fast as possible. We tech transferred to a contract manufacturer in Italy that's already made just over 6,000 doses. And we're doing a lot of work at outsourcing this uh, particular process to other contract manufacturing organizations in the UK and in the Netherlands. I'll come back to that in a moment. We're trying to get up to 2000 liter scale, which we think is very possible. Just summarizing the preclinical data that we were pretty keen on getting before we started the clinical trial. Interestingly, not to prove that the vaccine worked and it did work very well in, in macaques, but to show that on challenge, those macaques did not have immunopathology. And this has been a big discussion amongst regulators as to whether particular types of uh, SARS vaccine, and there was a bit of a problem with some SARS uh, preclinical studies, that's SARS-1, not SARS-2. And we, so we were happy to see that there has been no immunopathology in our animals. And we waited for those data to start the clinical trial at the end of April, as it says there. So what are we doing right now? We've just finished dosing in the phase one, two B trial. So what do we mean by one phase two? It's a phase one trial in 1100 people, but only 550 get the vaccine. The other 550 get an irrelevant meningitis vaccine. That's because there's an efficacy component in this first in human trial. And that's super unusual. So why were we allowed to do that? by regulators who normally take months to let you go from phase one to phase two. And of course, the reason is they knew this vaccine technology platform. We've done over a dozen of these type of vaccine trials before as first in human trials. They knew the manufacturing approach and they knew the safety profile. So we're following those individuals now for several weeks and for months, in fact, to see who gets uh, COVID. And in a week or two's time, we'll expand into the phase 2B3 trial, which is a randomized control trial, 5,000 dosed adults with the COVID vaccine and another 5,000 controls. So that's 10,000 individuals across, I think it's 18 sites in the UK we now have. We've just expanded that. And these individuals will be followed until we get a result or we run out of cases. So what I mean by that is the epidemic is on the decline in England, uh, not very fast, happily for us, not so good for everyone else. Uh, and we anticipate that with a fair wind, we might get an efficacy result by August. So we hope to be first to finish. We weren't first to start, we were actually fourth. But if the incidence continues as it is on a gentle downward slope, and remember lockdown is being, uh, eased off in, in the UK at the moment, we should have the 20 or so cases we need to get, our, get a read on efficacy. So you'll note we didn't do dose finding, we picked a dose, we knew that from previous vaccine trials with this technology platform and went straight in at that. We didn't have time to, to find the best, the best dose. It's generally about five times 10 to the 10 for these adenoviral vectors. So I'll finish with a word on manufacturing supply. 
We made the phase one material in-house at our own facility. Phase two was made in Rome at a contract manufacturer. We're scaling up at several European contract manufacturers. They're not very large scale. We can only go to 200 liters with those. So we've brought on board two of the largest manufacturers in the world, Wuxi outside Shanghai, and the Serum Institute of India, who we work with on other programs at the Jenner Institute, like uh, malaria. They can do huge supply, both for manufacture and for filling. And that's our plan, that by the end of this year, if everything works out, they'll be going full scale, producing hundreds of millions of doses. And to supplement that, of course, we're lucky to have uh, come to an arrangement with AstraZeneca, where we've out licensed to them. They're very busy now, mounting clinical trials in several places, particularly in the United States to complement what we're doing at the moment. That's just the manufacturing diagram. I'll just mention that if we don't get an efficacy result in the UK because there aren't enough cases, we do have some backup plans in India with ICMR, Brazil, Bangladesh, South Africa, Kenya, and very active discussions with uh, the US authorities about a trial in the US as well. So I'll leave it there. It's a pretty fast moving program. It's been a joy to do, it's been exhilarating. We like to do all trials at this speed. There are good reasons why we, we can't. It is a faster way of developing vaccines. Maybe we could learn lessons about developing other vaccines faster. We need probably to go outside the UK to address some of the questions Tony Fauci mentioned. What about in malarious areas of Africa? Will the vaccine work? It's a big world. If you make a billion doses, that's record breaking, but there are 7 billion people, so we need other vaccines. And lots of questions, as you know, about how this panic, that pandemic will, uh, will play out. Thank you. Uh, Adrian, thank you very much. We'll come back to some of those issues, but uh, I appreciate your emphasis on the global focus and also that you, at this point, you're still exhilarated and not uh, exhausted. I, I hope it stays that way. Um, I'd like to go to uh, to Tal Zaks uh, now. Uh, Tal, as you've had a, a different process at uh, Moderna. This is a, a new type of uh, vaccine platform, different than the one we just heard about, one that uh, Tony Fauci in particular has highlighted for the speed in which it's been possible to go from um, uh, just identifying the virus and its uh, sequence to uh, actual production and testing. So uh, give us an update on what you're doing and, and what you're looking ahead uh, for. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I'm not going to use any slides. Uh, I'll just keep this uh, verbal. Um, and, and I'm going to sort of talk about three points. Why mRNA to begin with? Where are we and where are we going? So, so mRNA for us, and we've been at this now for a number of years, is really an opportunity to teach the body, excuse me, to make a vaccine in its own cells. And I start with that because I think the most, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting excited. Uh, <laughs> I think the most salient part of our vaccine is the fact that we believe we are doing this with the right biology. And so what, what do I mean by that? If our cells are making the protein antigen, then there's no question of getting the wrong confirmation because it's the same genetic information essentially that the virus would use. We can sometimes sort of modify it to, to improve it a, a bit, but we're basically skating down with evolution here. Uh, there's no risk of uh, formalin and activated chemical moieties uh, and all the history of, of, of that goes along with that in terms of chemical modification that would change the antigen, you're getting the right kind of antigen presentation. And we've now proved it. So uh, in terms of our experience, well, we've actually dosed now over 1,500 subjects across um, several vaccine candidates. In fact, seven positive readouts for phase one trials uh, within that mix. We've gone after eight different viruses. The numbers don't match up because in one of the vaccines, we actually put two different respiratory virus mRNA encoding for the antigens of two different respiratory viruses in one LMP and proved that independently we could stimulate the immune response against either. Five of these viruses for which we've shown an immune response are actually respiratory. So two strains of flu, respiratory syncytial virus, parent influenza virus three, um, human metanumovirus, you hear the words respiratory, you know, pneumo, uh, influenza and that. So we clearly have experience now in the clinic of being able to generate the immune response. So, and by the way, when you express a protein from within the cell, you're going to get T cell responses because that's how our immune system works. And so, and we've demonstrated that, uh, you know, with a completely different application of personalized cancer vaccines. 
So I think the, the essence here is starting with getting the biology right and being able to simulate the immune system. And the second element is speed. So, you know, I completely agree with uh, Dr. Fauci, and it was an honor to have him here and listen to him, that we need more than one vaccine to succeed. And in this race, I quip that I don't have, you know, my only two competitors are the virus and the clock. So I think we can beat the virus based on the biology. I think we can beat the clock based on the technology. And the reason I say this is because you've got a technology that starts from the digital information of the sequence. That's how we went in two days from the sequence being published and available on the web to actually sending in our first uh, um, vaccine into production. And the essence of our process is really an enzymatic liquid phase process. So what for a common technology is a large scale production is a 30,000 liter vat that takes three stories of a building and a billion dollar in cap capex in years to build. For us, it's actually a 30 liter bag that doesn't require any new CapEx because you've got plenty of those already lined up for all of our other applications. That speed is what enabled us to get started so fast that I think in the, uh, in the, the, the anticipation that the NIH team has had, and so we've been working with them for a number of years, so we were well poised for this collaboration, but that same speed is what should enable us to scale up the process. And we've started already to invest at risk like everybody else uh, BARDA has come in to, to support this as a public-private partnership, but that speed and now the collaboration we've recently announced with Lonza is what we're anticipating should enable us to make a billion, up to a billion doses next year, uh, assuming we, we understand the dose or you know, there's some assumptions baked into that. So we're well on the way to rapid production here with what we believe is a product that has the right biology. Now. Where are we? Well, uh, I think as many people may know, we are very fortunate to be in a strong collaboration with the NIH. They have actually taken the first phase one trial into the clinic. Uh, we expect uh, the readout from that in terms of true clinical immunogenicity in the weeks to come. We uh, recently filed and are on track to start the phase two, which will essentially expand the safety database while uh, reaffirming uh, the dose and the immunogenicity. That still is an immunogen and immunogenicity endpoint. And we're in very active dialogue with our um, partners at uh, NIAID, uh, as well as with FDA, on what would uh, the pivotal trial or trials look like in order to actually ascertain uh, the benefit here. And I say this, and, and um, my expectation is that it is absolutely critical, both for this vaccine and for us as a company uh, with our technology, it is absolutely critical to get the right large trials launched to be able to demonstrate both safety and efficacy in a true placebo controlled manner. And so uh, I think we're in a fortunate position to be in the lead in that race and to be partnered with the best mind in the world to, uh, to make sure that we get it right. And uh, if by doing so, we actually pave the path for the others that are following in our footsteps uh, in the sense of uh, our trials will be sufficiently powered and conducted to establish correlates of protection, um, I think that's great, and that's great for the field in its entirety. Great. Uh, uh, thanks, Tal. And the point about correlates of protection, you know, um, indicators around viral measures and the like that could be earlier markers of, of response that could uh, speed up processes even further. We don't know enough now, but that is a very important uh, side goal of these early clinical trials that you're, you're going to be a part of. Uh, so thank you. Um, I'd like to turn now to, uh, to John Reed from Sanofi and John, I know uh, you, you all have a, a, a different kind of platform. Maybe talk a little bit about that and how the development process and the issues that we've been discussing today look from, from your standpoint. Well, thanks, Mark. Thanks for the opportunity to give an update on uh, the approaches we're taking at Sanofi. I want to start by first uh, acknowledging uh, you know the many uh, contributors to this global effort to combat COVID. Um, you know, maybe in particular would cite the uh, FDA and the partnership with moving rapidly in terms of the regulatory issues for review times and and, and open-minded thinking about uh, how we might prosecute uh, vaccine development in this space. Particularly like to recognize BARDA for their partnership. Sanofi has been partnered with BARDA for 15 years now. And uh, we've worked on Zika and SARS and pandemic flu with them, and now we're working on coronavirus. 
and a lot of those uh, early collaborations and investments that our government made through BARDA have uh, provided the foundation for uh, our lead approach to the vaccine that we'll talk about. Um, I would just mention before I start on vaccines that Sanofi is also trying to make an effort in other ways. We are exploring drug repurposing opportunities for treatment of COVID-19, uh, including uh, studies with Plaquenil, better known as hydroxychloroquine, and uh, with uh, Kevzara, our IL-6 receptor antibody partner with Regeneron. Uh, so there, uh, those types of efforts are underway as well. So on vaccines, the um, the platform, uh, we're, we're, we're taking two approaches. Uh, one is, a, I would say, a fairly traditional approach with a protein antigen. The platform we use is a uh, insect cell expression system, baculovirus system, um, a fairly now common recombinant DNA technology for producing the spike protein from coronavirus. It's exactly the same platform we use to make influenza today. Uh, the vaccine, the egg-free vaccine is produced with that, uh, goes by the brand FluBlock, an approved product uh, that uh, has been in use. And so the, um, the platform is well validated clinically uh, and it's a platform we can deliver at scale. Uh, we don't know for sure the dose yet of the vaccine, but we would guess that at our current manufacturing capacity, we could do something like 600 million doses a year and with uh, additional expansion underway within a year, we should be at about double that in terms of capacity. Um, you may have heard that we're also partnered with GSK to provide an adjuvant that will be combined with the protein antigen. In this case, uh, goes by the term ASO2, it's uh, ASO3 rather. It's a um, pandemic scale adjuvant that has also been used in other approved vaccine products and something that GSK brings uh, to the table that can be <clears throat> produced at uh, the scale of billions of doses for uh, producing what we hope will be a, a more effective vaccine that is uh, more broadly effective uh, uh, across a range of patients to, of different ages, uh, different levels of uh, sort of immune sensitivity, et cetera. Um, having the adjuvant too may uh, help with durability of the uh, antibody response, et cetera, we'll, we'll have to see. Uh, so that's our, our lead effort. Uh, we expect to be uh, in the clinic uh, later this year. Uh, in parallel, to have another shot on goal, we've expanded a collaboration that we've had ongoing with uh, Translate Bio, which is also an mRNA therapeutics company, it's a, uh, similar to Moderna. Um, they, um, uh, you know, have an mRNA therapeutics platform together with a proprietary lipid nanoparticle delivery mechanism that um, we found attractive. Um, so we're trying to push that forward. Uh, the scale at which uh, that can be produced today is at around 100 million doses a year uh, with uh, additional at-risk investment in, in manufacturing. We hope to have that up to um, something approaching uh, half a billion to a billion a year. Uh, within about a year. And um, that uh, technology we hope to be in the clinic probably very end of this year or early next. So those are the uh, the uh, area, the strategies we're taking currently to try to do our part to provide the world a safe and effective vaccine. We'll have both of those approaches um, underway in parallel with some of the other efforts you've heard about and hopeful that uh, with the work that NIH is doing and NIAD to harmonize protocols so that we can have as close as possible direct comparisons of how the various vaccines perform that, that um, will hopefully be able to offer patients and society several opportunities with uh, several vaccines that are equally safe and effective for, the, for protecting the public health. Great. Um, thank you very much, John, for, for that overview. And I want to pick up on your point about the issues of aligning and then implementing this uh, clinical testing and further development at scale. Um, so we'll go to Peter Marks for that. Uh, as I mentioned, Peter's the director of the Center for Biologics at, um, uh, at FDA. And Peter, you know, everybody talks about FDA being drinking from uh, a fire hose. Uh, you've got five, 10 or more uh, fire hoses uh, pointed right at CBER for trying to support this 
very uh, timely and critical process of going from all of these promising but diverse types of vaccines into clinical testing, potentially at the same time or overlapping time. Some of this has already started, as you've heard, and uh, even for the, the vaccines that take a little bit more time to get into clinical testing, very accelerated uh, pathways with lots of uh, production scale uh, being considered. Um, maybe you can talk about how you're bringing this all together. is uh, uh, right at the middle of all of it. Yeah, so there, there is a tremendous amount, oops, uh, there's a tremendous amount uh, going on uh, all at the same time here, um, and it is it is a fire hose of uh, of, of activity. Um, uh, there are obviously leading candidates coming forward, as well as many uh, behind. If if you look at the WHO, the WHO keeps an updated list of of candidates in development, and they now have over a hundred on that list, and uh, uh, some of them uh, are obviously more advanced than others. Um, we're at a place here where we're trying to give the best regulatory advice we can to everyone that's in, in the process of developing this, not just the best regulatory advice um, for normal times, but the best regulatory advice for the times that we're dealing with now, which is we need a, a, a vaccine here that's safe and effective. I think Dr. Fauci just articulated it beautifully. We need something that checks all the boxes for a safe and effective vaccine, but we need it really quickly. Um, because our way of life has been threatened in a way that not in my lifetime have I seen anything like this. Um, and unfortunately, I guess what, what gets us uh, and keeps us uh, going on uh, th three hours of sleep a night and several cups of uh, dark roast a day um, is that, you know, there's the concern about what could happen this fall and winter uh, if, if this really takes off again and there's a second wave that dwarfs the first. So we have a lot of impetus to help work with sponsors. And I think we're, we're willing to take certain calculated uh, risks with getting things into phase one. That doesn't mean that people can skip doing preclinical work, but where we know platforms have been used before, um, we're willing to uh, potentially allow people to proceed and uh, simultaneously with doing preclinical work. I think you'll see us being uh, very amenable to novel designs. Um, as we move forward though, I think an, a really important thing that we're gonna have to remember though, is at the end of the day, we're gonna have a vaccine that's gonna be used in hundreds of millions of, uh, of people in the, in the United States and possibly um, uh, billions globally. And granted, I think again, what Tony said is he's, he's so spot on. There's a reason why uh, Brad Pitt has to play him. Um, or he plays Brad Pitt, I don't know, whichever, um, uh, is that he's so spot on, which is that we probably need vaccines uh, given the capacity um, uh, for any to manufacture any one given vaccine. But um, getting that in a way that we have robust evidence so that people uh, feel comfortable taking that, because having spent some time with people who have real concerns about taking vaccines, um, I know that this concept of operating at you know, warp speed operating very quickly is, is concerning, but I think we have to be able to assure people that what we're doing is just el eliminating empty space um, and not um, making, taking shortcuts here. And, and toward that end, I think what, what Tony was talking about, we're trying to, I think, help people design phase three clinical trials that will get to an answer that we need. Um, I think we're very open to novel <laughs> ways of figuring out when one could broaden out um, and use things uh, uh, earlier uh, once one has a, 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 a trial fully enrolled. I, I, it is possible that, um, that for some of these large trials, provided the trial is a very large trial, we might be able to have planned interim analyses after a trial is fully enrolled. It's also possible that um, I think when we hear this word emergency use, people think about, well, that we, we wouldn't, you know, that would short circuit a phase three trial. Not necessarily. It's possible that, you know, there's white space between when a phase three trial is finished mm -hmm. and when a manufacturer submits a biologics license application. And given that we, I, I can tell you that I know that, that, I may be operating on three hours of sleep and, and lots of cups of coffee. I know that, that the vaccine manufacturers are operating on less. They're trying their best here. So we realize that it may be, there may be a few months after the phase three that's positive till they can actually get us 
a, uh, a an application. So mm -hmm. we'll we'll look at what we can do to fill that. Um, obviously, one could have a very large expanded access treatment protocol. You know, we have treatment scale expanded access. The alternative would be uh, to use something like uh, EUA at that point, and that to me is a mm -hmm. reasonable use of EUA, not to uh, I think, and it's consistent. Um, with not uh, uh, abrogating the ability to get the kind of answer that we need here, because we really do need an answer. Having something that's not uh, not what it it looks to be is not going to be good here. So I think we need an answer of how efficacious these things are in a traditional vaccine efficacy trial, and will uh, and I think we can get that. Uh, and it's unfortunate, I think, that we can actually. You know, it, it's. <laughs> It, it, it's, it's, it's sad that we're in a situation where we're going to have so many cases that we can get that either in the United States and or South America and elsewhere. But mm. I think what we are encouraging sponsors to do is to be ambulance chasers, so to speak, chase, go, go where the cases are, not where our traditional sites are, um, because mm. then we'll get the answer here. And I think just the final thing I'll say is as much as I'd like to say we've learned a lot about COVID-19 disease and SARS coronavirus 2, I don't think we really fully understand what the correlates of protection will be here. And for that reason, I think a good old fashioned efficacy trial that could have been done in 1950 or 1975 or today um, uh, is, is going to help us get to an answer that will be definitive, we'll know what we've got, and, and we can on the back end, work out all the science. Um, but I think we need to know that what we have at the end of the day is a safe and effective vaccine uh, that we can apply to a large number of people that we can scale up and manufacture. Um, and then we have multiple vaccines that can go down this route. Yeah, Peter, thank, thanks for your leadership on all this. I, I do want to ask you one follow up on this last point about, you know, the, I guess the good news is that it does seem like people do mount a strong uh, immune response to the virus. We've got lots and lots of people who are recovering. So that's, that's good. It seems like this ought to work, but we don't know. Um, and that's why you're uh, taking all these steps to make sure as Tony and, and everyone on this panel has emphasized getting that uh, clinical evidence on safety and effectiveness as quickly as possible. Could you say a little bit more about how to uh, how to do that? Um, it, it sounds like you're you're going to be overseeing or guiding a, a number of advanced uh, clinical trials with large populations in at-risk areas. Um, we've gotten some comments in uh, uh, from our from our um, audience who are uh, concerned about making sure you know in particular we're getting evidence in high-risk groups, since the elderly or people with comorbidities. Uh, people in uh, disadvantaged uh, neighborhoods and so forth, where typically it's really hard. Uh, we really don't do clinical trials well in that context. And now we're going to try to do three, four, five, six uh, at the same time and make them as focused as possible where there really is that, that opportunity of finding a signal or, you know, unfortunately there, there will be continuing outbreaks. Can you say a little bit more about how uh, CBER is, is putting all that together with the companies? Yeah, so I think part of this is a matter of, of how you strategically, where you where you place your trials, where we try not to have everyone uh, getting into a traffic jam in certain locations. So I think part of this will be to try to help companies space out where they are doing their trials, because there's enough circulating coronavirus right now that people will be able to find cases without having two trials um, right on top of each other. And in fact, we really wouldn't recommend that you have two separate uh, vaccines in trials at the exact same sites. That's going to lead in separate trials because that's going to lead to bias. Uh, so um, the goal here is to have people spread out if they're doing separate but aligned trials. And um, uh, I think that's been one of the things that Tony has really, I think, spot on that, that Francis Collins, Tony have been trying to work. And there'll be, you know, I think there'll be more discussions coming along with this is to try to get the community to work together, and even if the trials aren't identical, to have endpoints that are uh, close enough that we can, at the end of the day, know that we're comparing apples to things that are apples, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, or apples to at least things that are fruit and not mm -hmm. apples to rocks um, or mm -hmm. something else. Uh, so I, I think that that's gonna be a way, trying to have some traffic direction here, and, and to work strategically with protocols that are uh, similar 
uh, will be very helpful in, in, in thinking about this. Um, ultimately, look, there, there are going to be, it, it's possible that things will fall out in development as, they, as it's naturally gonna be the case. And I think we're very grateful for everyone for trying. So nobody, I don't think in this, there are, any, there are no winners or losers. Everyone here is a winner for trying because I think globally, um, all of us need to work together to, to come together to, to defeat this because for all of us, we're not getting back to normal life. Pharmaceutical companies aren't going to sell their normal wares in normal mm -hmm. ways until we get this under control. So I think this is a wonderful time for us to come together, put aside differences, try to harmonize to the extent possible, um, and, and realize that ultimately we need the best product that we possibly can get to. I mean, ultimately, uh, a, a, a product that has really good uh, efficacy would be delightful. Something that could get to herd immunity would be really, really nice, but we'll take what we can get. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, so I'd like to go back to some of our other panelists. Uh, in light of this discussion, what you all see is some potential challenges ahead and how to overcome them. And Tal, maybe I can start with you. Uh, as you noted, you've got a novel platform that's gone very quickly from, again, just understanding the sequence to to, to substantial uh, production and clinical testing, uh, but it is new and it, there's not quite that same record of safety studies at the large scale and diverse populations as we've got in some of these other vaccine platforms. Um, what are some of the steps that you're taking? I know you talk about effectiveness uh, signals, uh, but maybe a little bit more on the, the safety side and how we can accelerate that process. Um. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question, Mark. So look, it's obviously top of mind, both for in the context of this pandemic, but also for us as the first uh, and, 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 and a very large phase three that we're looking at, uh, that's going to be informative for the platform at large. I think on the safety side, I think our view is congruent with that of the agency and vaccine developers, which is the best uh, and first place that you evaluate safety is in a placebo-controlled randomized trial. Uh, and I think that that's how we're thinking about that. We're going you know, from phase one to phase two to phase three. We're right. going to accelerate that. And so we're going to continuously learn and we're going to react to anything that we learn midstream. So uh, we have to set up the trials and the systems in such a way that they're all very well coordinated and transparent. Um, Based on the experience of the platform today, I think the risk is that we don't know what we don't know. That being said, from what we've seen so far from the platform is the risk is, uh, you know, safety and tolerability is exactly that which you would expect from, from, mm -hmm. a, from a vaccine, right? Uh, right? Some local reactogenicity and some flu-like symptoms. So mm -hmm. uh, we will monitor it carefully and we'll make sure to, uh, to do it in the appropriate way. I think the, the two challenges that I see, frankly, are first despite our best intentions, we will face tremendous pressure once it's clear that some of these vaccines can induce an immune response and it's the same level of immune response that you see in convalescent people and it's the same level of immune response that you see in animals that are protected from, from the challenge. Uh, and I think that's gonna put a lot of pressure on us to uh, accelerate the ability to collect the safety and efficacy data because in that in betwixt we will all feel very uncomfortable especially for those of us who are sort of leading the pack and already will be manufacturing and sitting on hundreds of thousands of doses that could be deployed mm -hmm. so I think that's one thing that um, I while I agree wholeheartedly with everything that's been said I mean let's be honest I think that is going to be uh, the world in which we live when it comes to August, September, if not sooner, depending mm -hmm. on, on the data. I think the second element that I'm looking ahead to is how do we ensure that that initial deployment is done in a way that allows us to continue to collect safety and, and speak to our emerging understanding? Because I completely agree with uh, two things that were said by Dr. Fauci and Dr. Marx. Uh, the first thing is that this is not going to be a sudden watershed moment. We didn't have a vaccine, now we have a vaccine. We will continuously learn about the potential benefit and ultimately the benefit, and we will continuously learn about the safety and tolerability profile, and we will continuously learn about the performance first in healthy adults, then in older adults, and adults with comorbidities, and in pediatrics and special populations, etc. And so we will need to adjust how we think about it to that continuous learning. 
And we will also live in, a, in an environment, unfortunately, the way it's looking, where the need is going to be very palpable. I don't think any of us thinks that come August 1st, the cases are going to disappear and it's going to be impossible to run trial, right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. Uh, but what that also tells me is we need as a society to step back and accept the benefit risk paradigm here and really think carefully about the potential benefit to society of approving a vaccine versus the potential risks and a relatively emerging and young uh, safety database. I mean, look, in the best case scenario, all of us anticipate having a vaccine out there that's going to have less than a year follow up. When would we have ever considered that? But the reality is we have to get there because of the nature of the pandemic. Right. And that's uh, very important, as you said, a stepwise process with maybe early use, uh, expanded use, and a lot of post-market evidence collection, or if there is any expanded access before approval because of promising signals, uh, collecting a lot of data in that context, too. Um, I, there's so much we could discuss. I, I'd like to go back to, to John and then to Adrian. Uh, John, um, a similar question for you, uh, challenges that you see ahead and maybe in particular around uh, the importance of getting to, to, to global scale at the same time as we're, we're doing these uh, clinical studies and really just understanding uh, safety and effectiveness. Yeah, I think uh, Taos raised excellent points around, you know, what level of evidence uh, will be required for at least some sort of a conditional approval uh, versus how much of the data on safety and efficacy be collected in the post-marketing circumstance uh, and particularly around the safety, I would guess. So I think that's, you know, certainly a, a conversation we'll be having in partnership with the regulators and um, likely that, uh, you know, we'll see uh, more flexibility than we've ever seen before in, in the context of bringing vaccines to the public, uh, assuming that at least the early going, it looks like uh, we're not seeing any untoward safety issues. Um, in terms of the um, the, uh, the the scale issue, um, you know, I think it really uh, varies a lot with each of the strategies being uh, uh, being brought forward. As I mentioned, at least with you know the same platform that we uh, at Sanofi already use for producing influenza, we we have that available already at at, at you know fairly good scale. As I said, probably mm -hmm. around six hundred million doses a year. Uh, we think we can double that pretty quickly. Uh, but there are 7 billion people around the world, <laughs> and that's why I also am uh, hopeful that the ultimate solution is not a single vaccine, but it's several uh, options that are more or less all equally effective and safe, you know, that can be used uh, uh, in combination to address the uh, the needs of, of the entire world. Um, you know, as we know, bringing manufacturing uh, capacity online is not a snap of the fingers sort of endeavor and it's something that does uh, require uh, planning ahead. Uh, within Sanofi, we would, you know, we would potentially have the ability to stop producing some other vaccines in order to make more of this vaccine by taking offline other, other vaccines. Altogether, we produce something like a billion doses a year of vaccines now. Uh, but the um, but obviously there are tra there are trade offs to those kind of decisions as well because uh, those vaccines are uh, made available to the public for a good reason because <laughs> they bring benefit to uh, to uh, society in terms of uh, protection so um, so that I think uh, you know there's there's a certain amount of uh, levers we can maneuver but not an inexhaustible number and so I think with a collective approach though uh, uh, across the industry uh, we'll get there. Thank you. And um, Adrian, I'd like to go to you for some uh, final thoughts on this panel. Uh, uh, again, similar question, Ch big challenge you see ahead and, and how we can overcome it, what we should be playing for now to overcome it. Yeah, the one I really worry about is the one we don't know anything about. There are going to be surprises here, mm -hmm. so the unknown unknowns. Um, ju just along that line, you know, if we have a vaccine that's say 80% effective and we haven't talked about that yet, how good is good enough? Is 50%, 70%, 90%? How long does it have to last? Does it need to work in everyone? Does it need to work in 85-year-olds as well as it works in 45-year-olds? Uh, they may be the most vulnerable group, certainly age group. So, so questions like that will play into the public response to vaccination. 
it's a fraught area anyway. Yeah. What if there are lots of people in areas who refuse to accept vaccine and there are infecting other people? How are we going to deal with that? Just accept it uh, if everyone else is being vaccinated. So problems like that are, are tricky. Manufacturing, I completely agree with. We have a rather different uh, uh, non-US centric uh, strategy. Mm -hmm. The biggest producers of vaccines in the world are in Asia. We uh, work with a group in India, CMO in, in China. And they talk about per month. I mean, hundreds of millions per month, not, not per year. And filling, of course, is a huge challenge. Uh, the world is short of glass vials. I'm not sure if everyone knows about that. That may be limiting. We may be looking at 10 doses per vial, 20 doses per vial, just because of that I completely agree that we can't stop manufacturing other vaccines. We don't want any uh, outbreaks of uh, whatever they're preventing. Um, and uh, how is all of this going to come together? The big manufacturers are only in half a dozen countries that can produce hundreds of millions. Are they going to keep all of the vaccine till they've vaccinated their own country? I'm not talking about the US, I'm talking about India, I'm talking about China, I'm talking about any country that can do that will be very, very tempted to do that. We're being told in the UK that we've had a lot of UK government money. We have. The UK would like some doses soon, please. That's going to be the response everywhere. How do you cut a deal? If you're going to produce 500 million doses by the end of the year, does half of it go to the country where the big manufacturer is? And does it all go there if it's a big country? So there are going to be a lot of challenges that we haven't faced before because we've literally never produced this amount of vaccine for anything in such a short period and you. So it's the lessons we haven't learned yet I'm worried about. Yeah, uh, great points and an excellent transition, Adrian, to our next panel, where I'm going to pose that same question uh, to our to our panelists. Um, for right now, though, I'd like to, to thank you all. I, I, I'm still continuing my sense of uh, cautious optimism here. I think what you all have conveyed is that we're going to get a lot of evidence fast on, on many of these shots on goals in a matter of months, uh, but it's probably not going to be completely black and white. Uh, there'll be some additional questions and some issues, as Adrian just emphasized size that will uh, involve interactions between the level of evidence that we see, the state of outbreaks uh, uh, in different countries and, and around the world. Uh, so it's going to be an evolving process, but, but one that is happening at an unprecedented pace. So uh, I want to thank all of our, our panelists on this first panel for joining us and asking them uh, uh, right now, uh, get back to work, please. <laughs> we, we, we really appreciate uh, all the efforts. Um, so let me turn to our, our second panel and just uh, briefly introduce them as we shift our focus to uh, vaccine production and access at, at scale. And we're talking uh, global 7 billion uh, uh, potential scale here as well as at scale uh, here in the United States. Um, very pleased to have with us uh, Luciana Borio uh, at NQTEL, former National Security Director. Uh, for medical and biodefense preparedness, uh, Paul Stoffels, who uh, oversees uh, science issues at uh, Johnson & Johnson. I've got to know him as a uh, as a j and board member and someone who's very much involved in the global uh, perspective on all of these issues, as well as uh, uh, J&J's efforts. Uh, Richard Hatchett, uh, uh, leading the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, uh, an unprecedented, undertaking some unprecedented efforts to support uh, these uh, development and, and scaling efforts. And, and um, my uh, good friend and colleague, Victor Zhao, uh, the uh, president of the National Academy of Medicine, uh, who is uh, playing a major role in the U.S. and, and global efforts uh, as well. Um, I'd like to start out with uh, with Lou Borio. Um, Lou, since you've come from some significant government experience where we've had to deal with issues like uh, uh, urgent uh, development and access, uh, maybe you could help uh, uh, set the context for, for, for this panel for us. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Mark, for inviting me to be here today. It's really great to be here with everybody. And you know, Richard Hatchard and I go back a long way. We were residents together at New York Hospital <laughs> for now. So it's just so wonderful every time I have, can be on a panel with him. Um, and he's doing amazing work, of course, at CEPI. Um, so, you know, I think that um, it's, you know, the focus has been rightly so right now on development, on clinical development, so that we can have multiple shots and go and actually multiple goals. Uh, we do need more than one because no single developer can really meet the global need for billions of doses 
let's even say like, you know, within 12 months after a vaccine is found to be effective in a clinical trial, right? That's a huge number of vaccines. Uh, and it's gonna be essential to regain our health and economic security, you know, but it's, and it's wonderful to see the partnerships that are already emerging uh, between developers and manufacturers. An example, in Novio, partnering with Ology, the, the Department of Defense's uh, advanced def uh, ADM, the manufacturing facility and others. But, you know, it doesn't count until this vaccine makes it into people. That's the sad reality. Nothing counts until it's in people. And the clinical development is moving very fast. And I think it shows that the science of vaccine development has advanced tremendously over the last uh, years. Uh, I think, you know, Moderna's ability to get into phase one really demonstrates that as a concrete example. But the governance and the processes that are beyond development have not changed much. And they are going to be, you know, we're going to be developed and on the go now. Uh, they're going to require a tremendous amount of collaboration and coordination. I think on the development, I'm not going to belabor, you know, the importance of a common protocol, shared control arm, you know, common endpoints. I can't uh, I wholeheartedly agree with Dr. Fauci about the importance of a, a clinical endpoint, a hard endpoint, because uh, we're going to use vaccine for so many people. We just can't afford to be wrong, to vaccinate, mass produce and vaccinate billions of doses. And then says, you know, immunogenicity endpoint that we thought was good, really, we, I, I, you know, it wasn't really all that good. We just can't afford to be wrong. And, you know, it really isn't that much more complicated to go on a clinical endpoint. Uh, but and that there will be a point where we're going to lose equipoise. We'll know that a vaccine is effective. And I think if I heard Adrian Hill correctly, for them, it could be as early as August of 2020. And we lose that equipoise. So what are we going to do then? What are, you know, how do we get, uh, how do we scale up and how do we distribute the right uh, amount of vaccine? There'll be an ethical imperative to maximize the number of people that receive the vaccine. So I'll start, I'll just list very briefly a few issues that I think need to be addressed more robustly than they have been at least attended to. The manufacturing, we have you know, different technologies. I think there's good focus right now on preparing the manufacturing and initiating the full state, you know, preparing for full scale production of the vaccine drug substance before they are really found to be effective, manufacturing at risk. But have we done an analysis to know which sites would be able to switch to different vaccines of similar technologies so that we can redirect the manufacturing capacity to a winning vaccine after, after you done select a vaccine that may not be performing as well. That requires a lot of tech transfer and IP issues need to be attended to. Uh, the fill finish, it's easy to do in theory, but almost all of it has been spoken for. So what other saving products are you willing to do without to create space for this vaccine? And we do need to identify additional capacity and build additional capacity now. And of course, there are a lot of details that go into that. I think, you know, I, I think uh, I, I hear that there is a potential shortage of the, the substance that makes the gloss for violin. Uh, and, you know, there may be a need for alternative technologies. There is a public-private partnership that HHS and Apiject uh, established called RAPID, which is the idea of fill finishing vaccine in the in the, um, in blow fill seal containers that are commonly used for contact for uh, sterile eye drops, for example. So that's innovative. It's not gonna solve the problem of needle, needles. We still need the needles. So every little detail really matters uh, if we wanna get the vaccine into people. And um, so that's called the anticellular supplies. We don't wanna be in a, in a situation where we have the diagnostic test, but no swabs, right? That's, that would be just tragic. Yeah. So we have to pay attention to those now. Uh, lyophilizers, diluents, do we have electroporation devices in case uh, to, to make use of the DNA vaccine? The Novi vaccine requires that. Are we planning for those now? And I mentioned the needle problems because the supply today is really tailored for existing demand. Um, then I'll just move on to distribution. I think that uh, that's going to be huge, this prioritization of vaccine. It's going to be a limited supply from the get-go. There will be a global need for vaccine. And I don't think that we can... Uh, morally justify that only the countries, the vaccine producing countries retain all of the supply. I'm not sure how we're going to be able to move that, this dialogue forward. Uh, WHO has been and, and uh, been doing a tremendous job in highlighting this issue and doing their best to coordinate, but I think it's important to have the United States at the table as well. And um, it's in our own best interest. Um, I think the distribution, there's you know, this issue of um, 
allocation of vaccine, but there's also you know, the cold chain, ultra low temperatures if we need to. I think the Moderna vaccine is, requires low temperatures. Who's planning for all that? The pharmacovigilance, you know, we're gonna to have to maintain an eye on the safety and even efficacy after the vaccine is rolled out at large capacity. We're gonna to have to pay attention to duration of immunity, whether there's a drift of the virus, uh, you know, there, there's an effort. And then uh, not, um, I'll just two more things is the financing. Mm -hmm. Uh, we do you know, need uh, eight, uh, advanced person commitments to be able to continue to have these companies you know, engage in this. And the indemnification and liability protection, which the US has a good model, but I understand that is more of a challenge for the rest of the world. And I'll end with what I you know, the, the, the last but not least of all, which is the importance of trust in this whole process, because again, we can develop a great vaccine, but if the public doesn't really want to be vaccinated, it doesn't really do us any good. And I really fear that um, the communication around this uh, needs to be really carefully transparent, and we need to be able to communicate uncertainty and communicate where were the shortcuts or the white space, if you will, and that where are the uncertainties uh, and where's the benefit risk, and uh, what is all the science that is being done to support this expedited process. So trust is perhaps our most uh, valuable commodity in all this. Thank you. Luke, thanks. It's a terrific overview of so many critical issues going beyond just uh, clinical development, safety and effectiveness uh, evidence that need to be addressed now in order to address this, um, th this global pandemic at, at scale, ranging from the, the fill and finish, the distribution issues, the um, uh, advanced purchasing arrangements, uh, procurement, uh, and uh, issues like indemnification. So, so lots for us to follow up on now. I'd like to go next to, to Paul. Uh, Paul, I, I know you're um, in the midst of all of this. You've done some major advanced uh, purchase uh, uh, or, or advanced uh, manufacturing arrangements well ahead of even getting the uh, the J&J &J, uh, vaccine into uh, clinical testing. Um, I'd like to turn to you for, for comments on, uh, on how we move forward effectively on these challenging issues. Yeah, well, we start from, uh, we, we hit the ground running because we have been working in the area for 10 years with, uh, with different vaccines. We have been uh, collaborating with uh, with Barda and IMI on Ebola for several years now, and then uh, on, on on Zika we developed the Zika vaccine. Uh, we are uh, working on an RSV vaccine in late stage development, and we are developing an HIV vaccine. And so all all the time it is the same from a virus to an animal model, from an animal model to humans, and from then uh, also to upscaling and seeing how we can make. So we, we had a whole system ready and lined up to do this. Um, and so today we, um, we, are, uh, we, are, uh, we selected our final candidate, we are making seats, we are upscaling in parallel, uh, planning to start clinical trials the first week of September. And, uh, but at the same time in parallel, we are, we are running upscaling batches now. We are starting to, to get to upscaling where by the end of the year, we'll have a capacity which can produce next year uh, a billion vaccines. Uh, so we, uh, we have seen that we made a deal with Emergent and Catalan to, to, to bring the capacity on board. Uh, in Leiden, we have a manufacturing plant and so we are already midway of getting to the billion now with capacity we have on board. And like what, what um, what um, uh, Luciano was saying is, is that it's all, all correct. You have to look for everything, for vials, for needles, for capacity, filling capacity. You have to line it up. And so we try to, to do the um, a phase two of a large scale uh, placebo controlled study with different dosages and, uh, and placebo in a large part of the year. Of, of the year. That is planning for for um, recruiting between thirty and hundred thousand people uh, in a large scale study, and so hopefully to get to a, an efficacy endpoint somewhere early next year. The unprecedented collaboration with uh, with the regulators, both in the U.S. and and Europe, helped us. Initially, we were thinking on starting clinical trials early next year. We have been able to bring that back to uh, the first week of September, thanks to an intensive collaboration with the regulators but also with the experience on the platform. We have now vaccinated about 65,000 people 
with the, the at 26 platform, which gives confidence in different indications that it's a safe platform, it's a very immunogenetic genetic platform, and so we also know that we can make it. So that is that is um, that's where where we had the benefit of, of kicking off uh, very very quickly, um, and so um, where we can. It are different platforms, RNA, DNA, uh, the vectors and, and the proteins. So you have many trains on the rails, which each needs their own type of capacity. Um, uh, we have we use an at twenty we use at twenty six with a very specialized cell line, which is almost hand and glove working together. It's not that that is like switch you can switch that out very easily if the vaccine is not developed to be grown on those cell lines. And the, and the capacity to produce is very specific to a certain extent. Uh, what is not specific is fill and finish. Uh, there you can uh, absolutely jointly develop capacity in the world, uh, but with a lack of capacity, you don't get to a vaccine if you don't have it. And so I would not invest in a manufacturing plant uh, to make 300 million vaccines if I don't have the next phase in order to get to, uh, to, the, um, to the vials and get it to the fully done because otherwise you're stuck in the middle so and that's what's ongoing a little bit too much competition i think in the world on getting to that capacity but that's what we are driven to because there is no yet no coordination yet um richard can talk more about that what they're doing but um so that's what uh, we have one straight line in order with, with very high speed uh, going to results hopefully within uh, by the beginning of next year with efficacy data and availability of a billion vaccines next year. Um, only possible with extreme collaboration. Regulators, BARDA, the next phase on clinical trials with, uh, again, with, uh, we are talking with NIH, with, uh, uh, with um, NIAID, with HVDN, with all the different groups to see where to go. We, we are going to need flying teams to where the epidemic is in order to be able to uh, get to efficacy and a lot of preparation will be needed to uh, get to that point. So um, it's, um, it's a big challenge, but we have the teams to do it and, uh, and the commitment to do it and um, hopefully we'll make it. <clears throat> Paul, thanks very much. Uh, so now I'd like to go to Richard and, and Richard, you, you've heard about um, plans in place going all the way through to potentially hundreds of millions, billions of doses. That's more than enough for one country. But as you also heard, probably not all of these vaccines, if they do demonstrate safety and effectiveness, uh, but coming available at the same time. And um, as you also heard, 7 billion people around the world. I know you're doing a, a whole lot of work to try to address these challenges up to and including uh, issues like um, uh, vials and, uh, and indemnification. Uh, so I'd like to turn to you for comments on, on these tough challenges. Great. Thank, thanks, Mark. Can you hear me okay? Yes, just fine. Great. Um, it, it's a, it's a, Pleasure to be on a panel with Lou and, and Paul and Victor, and uh, uh, thanks, Lou, for your time for us. We've been through a lot over the years. Um, probably nothing as challenging as this, so I think I think you probably agree. Um, there, yeah, I, I, I wish that I only had to solve, you know, for three hundred million people. I mean, we we are truly trying to make a contribution to think about, you know, meeting the needs, uh, you know, through our partners, not not SEPI by itself certainly, but but we're having to frame all of what we're doing in the context of trying to make enough vaccine for whatever global demand ends up being, whether it's 4 billion, 5 billion, up to 7 billion uh, people. And to do that as quickly as we can and to overcome all of the challenges with delivering in those very different contexts and in a very dynamic environment, I, I would say, um, you know, things have, have been rapidly changing, obviously, since January. Um, the political environment is changing. The funding environment is changing. We're seeing uh, increasing, uh, you know, national investments, not led, led certainly by the U.S., but not just in the U.S. Uh, Germany, just a couple of nights ago, announced a 750 million euro uh, investment that they're planning to make. The epidemiology is changing. Our understanding of, of the virus is changing dramatically, of course. I think I'm, I'm sure I came on a bit late, so I didn't hear the early speakers, but I'm sure that others have attested to the, the global scientific community coming together in an extraordinary and unprecedented way. Um, the explosion of candidates, I, I spoke on a panel uh, with 
for Victor at the National Academy of Sciences just a few weeks ago and was reporting our tracking of uh, vaccine candidates globally. It was 135, I think, just a few weeks ago. I just checked the numbers from a week ago. We it, now up to 174 COVID-19 vaccines being developed globally across a whole range of approaches, live attenuated, replicating, non-replicating viral vector, recombinant subunit, uh, DNA, RNA, um, and, and globally uh, too, you know, 40, about 40% 40 in the US, uh, but the rest spread across Europe, Asia, um, and, and particularly in China. Uh, at this point, we have 10 vaccines in clinical trials, uh, at least one uh, already in phase two clinical trials with others entering soon, uh, and that number will increase dramatically. So you, you, you have an incredible ferment. Um, the other thing um, that has been commented on, I know in the US, maybe not as widely as it has been commented on in, in Europe and in other settings, uh, was the recent establishment um, by the EC, WHO, uh, and, and a number of sovereign partners of the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator, uh, the so-called ACT Accelerator, mm -hmm. which is focusing on accelerating vaccines as well as diagnostics and therapeutics. Uh, there was a pledging event on May 4th, uh, raised about seven and a half billion euros to support that effort. And I think the important thing, and, and this comes back to a point that Lou made, um, the important thing about it is it's, it's both focused on accelerating the development of the tools, but also focused on ensuring early access to those tools uh, globally. And I think what we're trying to avoid, the contrast here um, is, is with the outcomes of the pandemic in 2009, um, when uh, because of pandemic preparedness efforts over several years, a number of countries had contingent purchase contracts in place and, have, and essentially cornered the market on H1N1 vaccine, leading to a, a, a you know significant differences in the availability of vaccine to different parts of the world. In 2009, because the virus was such a mild virus, probably really didn't make much difference in outcomes. The, the vaccine arrived too late to affect outcomes in rich countries, and it probably had very little impact in poor countries. That's not the case here. And I think we all recognize that what is in fact the most equitable solution is probably from a disease and pandemic control perspective, also the optimal solution, which is globally distributing vaccine and quenching the pandemic, taking care of, of priority populations like healthcare workers and ultimately high risk populations globally as quickly as we possibly can so that we can begin to restore, um, you know, no normalcy and and begin to restore our economies, uh, as well as saving lives, which goes without saying. Um, there are there are uh, likely to be uh, many different vaccines, but there will also be many different settings in which we will use the vaccines. There will be uh, the challenge of delivering vaccines in lower and middle income countries. The challenge of protecting the elderly. You know, some vaccines, probably adjuvanted vaccines, will be will be favored for the elderly. The challenge of responding to countries that have epidemics that are out of control. Some two-dose vaccines are not going to be very helpful in that context. So I think we do need a, a suite of vaccines and we need to be very uh, clever about how we deploy them. Um, there are bottlenecks. We've, we've already heard about the bottleneck of glass, the bottleneck for fill finish. There are workarounds to those bottlenecks, but they actually commit you to certain pathways with respect to delivery. If, if we use 10 dose or 20 dose vials to allow more vaccine to be bottled, I mean, if Paul, I, I hope Paul is successful in getting to a billion dose capacity. There are other vaccines under development that could reach similar capacities you know, in 2021, but to be able to deliver all of that vaccine puts us into using probably 20 dose vials and, and where appropriate, probably vials without preservative. And that commits you to a mass vaccination program that many countries are not going to be prepared to deliver. So as we make these decisions about vaccine development, we need to make sure that those are integrated down the entire value chain of vaccine development and delivery, and that we are working on these issues like liability indemnification, that we are working on helping countries be ready to receive 
deliver and dispense vaccine. I'll stop there. Thanks. Great. Um, Richard, thank you for uh, putting all those issues together. Um, I'd like to go to Victor next. Victor, I know you've been thinking about some of these same issues too. So uh, I like your perspective, and then we're going to go back for some further discussion with the panel. Yeah, um, Mark, it's been a great uh, session. I've enjoyed listening to everybody, and I think most people covered the issues in a very comprehensive way. First, I would like to tell Richard and Lou, I was an intern in New York Hospital, much, much earlier than either one of you. Uh, <laughs> but be that as it may, we all have connection. I think Peggy Hamburg, too, was somewhere as a resident at the New York Hospital. <laughs> um, so I think the first session uh, shows the power of science and the great uh, collaboration that occurs in science, not only in the U.S. through the active program, but also globally. I think I do not uh, have any reservation about that. I think the issue is what was highlighted by Lou, by Rich and others about the last mile, actually it's not the last mile, it's actually starts much earlier than that, that we have equitable distribution for those who need it. This is the one that worries me most. And as, um, as Richard said, we participated in an $8 billion um, pledge event successfully because the currency exchange was good. It's actually more than $8 billion within one day. And it's targeted towards vaccine diagnostic and treatment. And myself, Jeremy Fry, and others play a very big role in enabling that to happen. Then comes the ACT accelerator that Richard talks about that begin to look at the end-to-end -end issues. Let's focus on vaccine. You know, so much is talked about in R&D, but when you talk about distribution, actually the manufacturing capacity is a bottleneck to begin with. And we don't solve manufacturing capacity in an equitable way, then country will lock up those facilities and therefore, despite your best intention, only some gets distributed the rest of the world, but not all. This is why it's such an important issue to talk about how to do this together uh, and then. Act Accelerated tries to do that. Both uh, Richard and I and others are involved with looking at the vaccine pillar. And, you know, but as we look at this and so much is being talked about, the capacity, the billions of doses, the fill finish, et cetera, if these are not available to everyone, and so this is the whole piece. So while you're doing uh, the issue of research and BADA is making these arrangements as a CEPI and others, we have to be sure we find a way which we actually have an agreeable way of making sure that everybody has access to them. So this is where some people call this vaccine nationalism. You know, as you heard, each country which have more money want to be sure as citizens have the vaccine. The question is, do we leave a lot of people behind? Africa, 1.2 billion people and others. And the economic buying power becomes a major issue. So we have to work very, very much together from the very beginning, and we have to have solidarity of all countries. So I'm encouraged by the ACT Accelerator. Certainly we're trying. Even the last few days I've been on the call with WHO, with the European Commission to discuss how to structure this. But I do think that it's absolutely important to address that issue. Um, I think um, Richard mentioned H1N1. I think we all remember back into the AIDS pandemic days where the drugs were available, but in fact, it got to Africa way, way, way much later, whereas the rich countries got them all. How do we actually make sure that we have that equitable access distribution? And, and I think there has to be some agreement in terms of how to de-risk the companies together. So capacity, in fact, are strategically addressed so that there's, in fact, sufficient access to everyone, uh, sufficient supply. There has to be an agreement on not only doing procurement, but how to do distribution. And Richard kind of talked about this. Do you look at population size, population risk, you look at who's going to get it first, healthcare workers, so you can reduce, in fact, the spread to high-level population to all the others. So I am certainly 
very uh, focused on this issue because there are so many experts who's working on so many, as you heard before. And I think it would be great to have a conversation of how US, China, and the ACT Accelerator can all work together to address this issue. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. And just uh, we've got a great discussion. And so we're having some of that discussion now, obviously not going to solve all these issues here, but I would like to push you all a little bit more. And we got about uh, 10 minutes left on this issue of uh, scale and broad access. So um, uh, Richard highlighted and, and Victor highlighted the 8 billion in funding commitments through uh, this uh, in, in conjunction with the ACT Accelerator and this international effort that you all have been so important in leading. That's on top of billions in additional commitments, uh, financial commitments from individual uh, countries, the US, China, uh, Germany, others that, that were that were mentioned. So I have two questions for, for each of you as we go around or two like your perspectives on, you know, num number one, how much of this is a financial support problem? Because that seems like if there's ever a case where that would be surmountable, this is it, given the, the, the enormous uh, uh, global health and economic consequences that every country is facing. Uh, this is relatively small compared to what every country is spending on uh, dealing with the, the consequences of not having uh, effective uh, immunity to, uh, to, to, to the virus. So that brings me to number two, you all have laid out some key challenges beyond the financing uh, to provide broad access. You know, obviously it's gonna depend on the pace at which we get enough evidence on safety and effectiveness uh, of vaccines, uh, but then very large scale. So Paul talked about a billion doses uh, by uh, the end of the year, early next year. That's, that's unprecedented. Um, it's still relatively small compared to 8 billion. Hopefully we'll have multiple vaccines that show effectiveness and uh, that we'll get this scale up, but what can we do further around manufacturing uh, scale uh, and also some of the other issues that Lou and, and the rest of you have touched on, uh, vials and uh, distribution and uh, prioritization. So uh, let me go back, uh, maybe start uh, again, uh, Lou, with you, uh, if you don't mind uh, some follow-up on the issues that you've heard about. Yeah, and I suspect, Mark, that I mean, I'm curious to see, but I think that a lot of us will agree on the, some of the, the, the key issues there is that this cannot be done by each individual you know, partnership, no matter how robust, it's gonna require some central coordination, uh, a global coordination, so that you can, because you know, so let's say for example, glass, you know, a lot of the facilities are in the US, Germany, or India, but then the needles are elsewhere. And the reagents are even, so there'll be, there must be uh, an, an entity, a coordinated entity that can really track and develop this very complicated logistics model that will actually adapt as new information. It's a very dynamic process. You have multiple developers, multiple vaccines, multiple trials, multiple needs. It's a huge logistics issue that needs to be ad adapted kind of on the go as new information becomes available. Yeah, um, and you know, I, I get the, the importance of global coordination, but Richard, maybe I can go to you to follow up on that. Um, seems like it'd be nice to have, seems like it's awfully hard to, to do in, in the real world that we live in and the politics and so forth. Uh, is there something to be said for, uh, in addition to these global efforts, maybe uh, pushing each of the countries, the, the wealthier countries, the US, uh, others, China, uh, to really be thinking about if they are building capacity locally to, to build beyond uh, just the needs of, uh, of, the, of their own country so they can be part of this overall effort too. Does it, does it all really need to be fully unified or can we uh, uh, do some of this work just like we talked about earlier in parallel? It, 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 that, that's actually the question that I wish you would ask, Mark. It's, 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 it's a really <laughs> important question because I mean, I think one of the things that I'd like to dispel for those listening is the idea that you know, national efforts are um, in competition with global collective efforts. I, I think they can be, you know, joined together in a, in, a, in a way that serves the greater interest of the world and actually serves e even the countries that are in a position to make significant national investments need the pandemic to end globally. So they need the global response to be successful as well if they are going to get on the road to recovery and the national investments, whether in the US or China or the UK or Germany or anywhere else are, you know, towards the same end as, as the global collective efforts, which is to accelerate vaccine development and to begin manufacturing it as fast as they can. And, and the quicker those 
countries can meet um, whatever, however they define their local needs. And different countries uh, with different degrees of commitment to, to multilateral um, efforts are going to define them differently. But however they define their needs, uh, they, they want to get to that point as quickly as possible. And, and they're likely to build capacity, which does not need to be turned off uh, as soon as the local needs are met. And, it, and if there were sort of commerce between the national efforts and the efforts that are being done collectively, which I think the collective efforts are, are going to necessarily focus on trying to assure global access, um, we'll get through this faster and quicker and at lower collective cost. Uh, thank you. And and Paul, I know you're working with many individual countries and also as part of this global effort. So, uh, uh, your thoughts on, on how we move forward on, on this challenge? Yeah, yeah first, um, I want to correct you, Mark. We are upscaling to the point that we can deliver a billion vaccine in the course of next year, not okay. by the end of this not, year. Not by the end of the year. Because that would be yeah. um, But no, I think the answer to what we try to take is to to produce globally, uh, meaning we, we are looking in uh, in the US, in Europe, in, in at least two countries, and then in Japan, and maybe somewhere in the South, if we can find the right, the right capabilities. I think the, the answer to vaccine nationalism is capacity, um, so that we can over deliver on capacity. And then uh, I hope we, the joint community of industry can make so many vaccines that you don't find enough arms to plug it in. Yeah, so that is that is probably the better solution, um, but that re requires investment now. Yeah? If you look time from from getting from a from a brownfield to a vaccine plant, you need two years. If you go from an existing plant to a working vaccine plant, it, it takes at least eight months to uh, to upscale, to validate the batches, do the pre qualification, do everything, yeah. tech transfer. It's a massive work, and so people think let's first work a little bit around R and D. And then start looking on how you're going to to build the capacity. That's not going to happen. Uh, then then we'll wait a year after the the phase three is done. So that's why this is such a challenging time that we need and the and um, the R and D running parallel with the, the creating the upscaling and the capacity building for getting to that billion vaccines. And if we do a billion and a few others do a billion, then we get to enough vaccines. But it, the investment needs to happen now and. And that's where it's a challenge because it's high risk. We don't know whether it works. Um, we have to make huge investments very fast. And that's where the national, the international collaboration is needed to offset at least some of the costs which, uh, which you have to invest in that entire enterprise. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it does seem like it's worth it for every uh, um, high-income country on the planet to invest, as as uh, Tony was saying at the beginning, in, in eight, ten, or more shots on goal with capacity planning ahead to go along with that. So that hopefully will help contribute to that excess capacity. I am, uh, after this discussion, particularly worried about our capacity for for vials. Uh, however, though, in addition to the uh, the, the production of the vaccines themselves, uh, Victor, turn to you for a couple of last comments on this. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I think Paul said it right. That's what I was trying to say. When you talk about distribution, it's kind of late. You got to really get started now. Look at capacity, and the capacity has to be done together, and uh, so that's the key issue. So you're right about eight billion dollars. The eight billion dollars, I can tell you how it started. I did it back in the envelope with Gavin Yami to say how much do we need. We put it to GPMB and we put that out there, and uh, UEU. President is willing to take it on. We recognize it's much less than what we need. We may need the hundred billion dollars, but mm -hmm. I think what's unique about this is a catalyst. It brought people together. It is flexible dollars, and you know we recognize all those manufacturing issues, etc. To be, you know, get into much more detail in terms of structuring the deals, etc., liability. But I think what happens is gets us together as a global community and enabling to become a global coordinating center. There's still a few countries that are not part of this. I would welcome them, invite them to be part of this conversation. It doesn't have to be paid to play. That was not the intention. Mm -hmm. The intention was a catalyst event to get people together. And now there's a lot of work going forward. Thank you.
Great. Uh, thank you very much, Victor. I want to thank all of you for laying out. Again, we haven't solved them yet, but uh, one very critical issue that we've seen throughout the pandemic is if you don't plan ahead for scale, including in dimensions that you wouldn't necessarily think about, like vials, uh, there will be problems later. And I truly appreciate all the efforts that, that you all are undertaking, uh, not only to uh, bring, uh, to develop these uh, uh, new uh, needed vaccines, but also to make sure we're doing it in a way that will get them out to uh, widespread use around the planet as, as quickly and effectively as possible. So more to come on all of this, but uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn to a wrap up discussion uh, uh, with Dr. Scott Gottlieb. Uh, Scott is a former commissioner of the FDA. He's been outspoken uh, on issues related to almost every aspect, or I guess every aspect of the, uh, of the coronavirus pandemic and also a, 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 one of my favorite and frequent uh, uh, collaborators on, on many of these issues and, and someone who's harder to schedule, I think, than Tony Fauci uh, these days. So, uh, Scott, uh, thanks so much for joining us. And I'd like to start. And it was one of, the best, one of the best senior <laughs> advisors you ever had, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, so I'd like to start on this process uh, in this wrap up and where we go from here about kind of your take on the discussion we just had about the, uh, the challenges in getting to, to global scale and, and respecting the uh, importance that, that many countries are placing on making sure they have access for, for their own uh, citizens as these uh, vaccines get developed. Well, look, um, I, I had written on this uh, in the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago, just talking about the fact that there is some strategic importance to having um, domestic manufacturing capacity and having a domestic manufacturer of vaccine that at least initially we're going to be supply constrained. Now we're saying the fact that companies are planning for hundreds of millions of doses, um, a billion doses aren't going to come off the, um, the production facilities right away. It's going to be the first 50 million doses. And the question is, how do you allocate that? And if we think back historically, you know, you and I were at CMS at the time that we had the challenges with Chiron, if I remember correctly, that was the name of the company. Um, and there was a good allotment of uh, vaccine that was being manufactured in the United States by a British manufacturer that I won't name. Um, for Britain, and it took a phone call from the Prime Minister of Britain to the President of the United States to get that released, and we were trying to hold on to it. And then, you know, another situation was back in 2009 when we had a uh, vaccine being manufactured for us in both Australia and Canada. And the Canadian detail I actually didn't know until recently was disclosed in some White House documents very recently. Um, but that vaccine was held on to by both those countries, even though it was um, U.S destined vaccine being manufactured on behalf of the United States companies in foreign facilities. And so it was held on to by those two nations until they had enough capacity to vaccinate their, their domestic population. And so I think we're likely to see some similar behaviors here where at least for the initial allotments of vaccines, countries are going to look to vaccinate their own population. Um, and, you know, equitable distribution might mean making some allotment uh, available early on, especially to countries that are locked out of the vaccine race and don't really have access at all. And don't have you know have the opportunity on the horizon to get to get timely access or maybe uh, countries that are experiencing intense epidemics where you might want to get vaccine in very early to try to quell quell an outbreak or an epidemic but i think that countries that are first to a vaccine are likely to use it domestically on some scale before they're shipping it um, outside their borders and so it does take on um, some level of both economic and strategic importance to make sure that you have domestic manufacturing capacity because the first country to a vaccine, I mean, it's inevitable. Uh, it's doesn't. It's not politically correct to say it, but it's inevitable that the first country that's able to mass mass inoculate the population is going to probably have more of an ability to experience an economic recovery um, than other nations that will be further behind that race. And that that it, it also increases the challenge of trying to make sure that we have equitable distribution around the world, recognizing you know, the importance of getting to a vaccine, but, but we shouldn't be, um, you know, we shouldn't be naive about what's likely to play out uh, around the world where countries are likely to try to use vaccine um, on their domestic population. And in fact, you can argue that any, any um, leadership that doesn't do that is probably um, going to be accused of being irresponsible to their, um, to their own populations. And so, you know, there's a number of efforts underway, obviously, in the United States by, um, countries, uh, companies located here and with domestic manufacturing capacity. Um, and I think it's really important that more than one succeed uh, because probably a single manufacturer um, isn't going to have the capacity to supply, certainly globally, but but even perhaps within the United States in, uh, in a rapid time frame. Um, I think I'll, I'll sort of pause by saying, I think the good news is, is the companies are all working on different kinds of platforms that creates a lot of um, 
opportunity for you know multiple shots on goal. So if one platform doesn't work, others are being tried. You have an adenoviral vector platform by J and J, the mRNA platform obviously by Pfizer, Moderna. I'm on the board of Pfizer. You have a more traditional approach by Sanofi um, and Merck. Um, you have a DNA approach as well. You have the protein approach that, that Sanofi's uh, using. So you have multiple different kinds of approaches, which I think is re really important. But um, but we should think about you know how how we're going to get there quickly by making the process itself more parallel um, by trying to do things in parallel rather than the sequential nature that we've traditionally taken. Yeah, I want to come back to some of those issues around uh, parallel steps to accelerate development without cutting corners on safety and effectiveness. Um, we, we did cover some of that earlier, and there, there are some next steps there to, to cover. But it does seem like, you know, sticking with this issue of global capacity, that, that a unique feature here, in contrast to, to previous outbreaks, H1N1 and so forth, is that the health and economic impact is so big in every high-income country on the planet that the kind of strategy that we've talked about today that the U.S. is pursuing, which involves uh, multiple shots on goals through this whole parallel process, getting to very large scale manufacturing, including through additional U.S. manufacturing capacity, is something that just about every country uh, should be pursuing. And if they all do that, to, to Richard's point earlier, uh, that seems like it does help contribute to a much larger uh, vaccine capacity being available. Still, it, it, it is going to be a challenge around you know, not all these vaccines are going to work out. Not all the evidence is going to be developed at the at the same time, and and, and so forth. But uh, in terms of getting to to big scale, uh, any other suggestions you've got to at least reduce the the pressure uh, for um, uh, restricting distribution and not making this a, a truly uh, global effort? Well, look, obviously the the investments in manufacturing, and we and Congress allocated the money to try to produce um, products at scale pre approval. So you know, shift to commercial scale manufacturing even before approval and start stock, start stockpiling product, knowing that some of these vaccines aren't going to make over the finish line. You'll have some product that you have to throw away. Um, but Congress specifically allocated money for that purpose. And should we, we should be trying to get that money out. Um, the contracting obviously has been a little bit slower. Um, I think the challenge here, though, is unlike manufacturing with antibodies. So if we wanted to try to scale up manufacturing for the therapeutic antibodies are in development, we could effectively build antibody manufacturing facilities that would be largely interchangeable and you can put the successful antibody yeah. into that facility. But with these vaccines, um, you know, the type of facility that you, you would use to manufacture an adenoviral vector vaccine is different than the type of facility that you would use for, for an mRNA vaccine yeah. where you yeah. need lipid components and other other components of the vaccine. So so it's not it's not plug and play, it's not yeah. interchangeable. So you can't just build a facility and then rent it out to whoever is successful. You actually need to scale facilities that are engineered to some degree for the vaccine that you're trying to develop. At least for each type of platform, yeah. Yes. That's right. And then you were one of the people who early on was saying that for testing, the problem wasn't just going to be access to the tests, it's going to be access to the swabs. And I think similarly here, you and, and Lou Borio and others have talked about the importance of paying attention to vials and, and fill, fill finish capacity. Um, are there some, you know, that is more generic. Is the, Are there some steps that we should be taking in, in that potential dimension of, of shortages and supply constraints that we're not taking now? Well, that should be scalable and that and we should be able to do some advanced planning around that. And you would hope that that's going on um, with Asper and FEMA and the agencies that are charged with thinking about this. Uh, you know, I'm not close to all those discussions, but that's certainly something we should be able to solve for um, up front. We also have to factor in that um, inoculation for coronavirus is probably going to collide with flu season. If you think about when mm -hmm. when the vaccine is likely to be available, it's sort of an end of 2021 event in an optimistic scenario. And so you're going to be looking to vaccinate for flu at the same time you're looking to vaccinate for coronavirus. You're pulling on the same supply chain um, for delivering those vaccinations. And it's a good bet that flu vaccination rates are going to be up this year. Manufacturers, flu vaccine manufacturers have increased uh, capacity quite a lot. So the number of doses that are being produced this season are a lot more than what was produced last season, um, anticipating that there's going to be increased demand for flu vaccines. And that's that could persist for a while. And so we could have... Yeah you know, 200 million plus people seeking to be vaccinated for flu in the United States at the same time you're seeking to vaccinate 200 million plus people for coronavirus at the end of 2021. So that's a challenge we're going to need to plan for because there's certainly not the capacity to pull off that kind of an event right now. Remember in 2009 when we went, when we had the, um, we got lucky in the timing of H1N1. Um, it appeared in April. 
they were just coming off finishing the, the, the trivalent um, flu vaccine. And so they were able to switch back and get the chickens working again um, mm -hmm. to make a monovalent vaccine. And then, mm -hmm. so they were finishing, doing the fill finishing on, on a trivalent vaccine. And then they started manufacturing the antigen for the monovalent vaccine. But that was a season when we were very strained in supply, if you remember back, because we had both people got inoculated that season with both the trivalent and a monovalent. It was a separate shot for H1N1. So that gives you an indication of you know what the challenges are likely to be coming up with the supply chain to be able to do that. I remember the discussions around that, mm. that we were worried about, um, you know, literally not having enough needles to give those injections. And we went to, if you remember, we went to... Um, multi-dose vials and there was a lot of concern around that because the multi-dose vials had preservative in them thimerosal because yeah. you have to put a preservative in a multi-dose vial but the only way we were able to extend the supply chain was to have multi-dose vials of the of the monovalent vaccine so and and that led to some issues around public confidence and trust uh, exactly as, as well and so these all seem like issues where more um, in addition to really planning ahead on building out supply uh, planning ahead on how to engage the public and and, and talk about all this is, is important too. And it's, it's not going to be sort of a black and white, you know, this vaccine is highly effective, easy to use. Uh, uh, it'll be more of a stepwise process. Right. Um, you spend a lot of time on public communications. Any thoughts on that topic? <laughs> um, well, look, I, you know, I think that this is um, going to be less of a challenge here, frankly, than it's been in the past because, um, because people are, are worried about this infection. Um, so I think uptake is going to be reasonably good, but to the extent that we're um, dealing with very novel um, vaccine platforms that you know are, are delivered differently than people are used to receiving a seasonal flu vaccine, I think that that's going to create some level of um, you know apprehension in, in the minds of the public. So I think trying to talk about like you know if these are going to be multi-dose, if if the vaccine here is going to be a multi-dose regimen, we need to explain that why it is. And how it's different than the flu vaccine because any sort of deviation from what people are used to with this sort of seasonal flu vaccine that's kind of the proxy in people's minds what a coronavirus vaccination regime would look like i think is going to add to the uncertainty that people feel i do think uptake is going to be um strong one indication will be to see what happens with flu vaccine this season um if we uh if uptake with flu vaccine uh is as strong as i think it's going to be because people um, are worried about coronavirus and want to at least get vaccinated for flu to reduce their risk of having um, being, you know, co-infected and having more morbidity or mortality associated with coronavirus. That's a good indication that probably uptake for the coronavirus is gonna be pretty strong, the vaccine. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about what the fall of and winter of 2020 is gonna look like. Um, uh, you others have uh, expressed some concern about not only a potentially strong flu season, but another wave of um, outbreaks related to, uh, uh, to COVID-19. Um, on, on the maybe more optimistic side, we heard today about a number of products that are in clinical testing now headed into clinical testing on a schedule where one could expect that the phase two, three trials to be, if not done by, by fall, at least uh, well underway. And perhaps uh, if there are uh, signals, as, as Tony Fauci talked about, in those trials, which still need to be completed, uh, of, uh, of vaccine effectiveness, uh, if it is a bad outbreak year, the potential for some early access. Now, now if, if that's the way things unfold, uh, probably starting with healthcare care workers and some other high risk populations, it may not be just, uh, you know, all the vaccine out for, for everyone at the same time. How do you see that actually unfolding? And is that a, uh, a, a reasonable, uh, if somewhat optimistic timetable to, to expect? Well, I think manufacturers should have two um, sort of development plans in their in their back pocket. One is a more traditional development plan where you vaccinate people who are at high risk of contracting it, people who come into contact with a lot of people. So, you know, grocery store checkout clerks, TSA agents. I think we actually would be reluctant to put it initially in healthcare workers. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe couple that with challenge studies. Um, I know that's, you know, there's discussion going on around that. And then the other development plan, which I think is what we're going to end up doing, which is you have an outbreak in a major city or multiple outbreaks in multiple cities and you do a, a clustered randomization where you basically mm -hmm. randomize people in a city at different intervals in time and then you, you compare the different um, cohorts to see if time of inoculation affected the propensity of different groups to get infected and that's that's a sort of elegant way to do a randomization around a large population where you're using something experimentally yeah. but also potentially therapeutically to ring fence um, ring fence and outbreak. I think and, we're going to unfortunately have broad access at the same time. And providing time. broad access. I mean, you can put it in tens of thousands, if not maybe a hundred thousand people. You look at the rotavirus um, 
vaccine, Rotatech, was in 70,000 patients. Uh, Gardasil, I believe, was in 60,000 patients. That was licensed when you were at FDA. So, you know, putting the putting this vaccine in tens of thousands of patients is probably how we're going to ultimately develop it in a large phase three program. I mean, I'm, you know, my concern just looking out at the outlook here, we're reopening against a backdrop of a lot of infection. You know, the the doubling times down to 40 is down to 45 days. The R is probably 1.1 right now. If you look mm -hmm. at some of the modeling coming off Wall Street firms, um, hopefully there's a big seasonal effect here. And as we get into July and August, some of this transmission starts to collapse. But when you come back in the fall, um, you know, if this sort of follows a, a pattern that's predictable for a virus like this, you're going to see um, an uptick in infection and, and new outbreaks. That a substantial uptick in the reproduction. Substantial rate. uptick. And, yeah. you know, that, that would be what happened with H1N1, um, which was far less contagious than this, where we also didn't have any cross immunity. That virus was epidemic all the way into June, collapsed really in July and August, was relatively quiescent. And then it came back um, powerfully in September, but we had a licensed vaccine in September. We licensed four additional vaccines in October, and we mass inoculated the population in December. Yeah. So on the one hand, tremendous amount of potential for uh, availability of vaccines with evidence of safety and effectiveness, at least enough to start making a big difference at truly unprecedented pace. Uh, but uh, no time to, to, to um, slow down and really need to plan ahead for all of these supply uh, and scaling issues um, so that we are as ready as possible for, for the fall. Um, Scott, thanks for joining us and thanks, and thanks to all of our panelists. Uh, this is not going to be our last uh, event on this or other topics related to uh, COVID-19 and the response. So I hope you all will uh, stay tuned to Duke Margolis and, and Alexandria Summit announcements about future activities. Uh, but for right now, I'd like to thank you all for joining us and turn to uh, Lynn Zadowski for some closing comments. Thank you so much, Mark, and thanks to our partners at the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy. Special thank you to Mark and Marianne Hamilton Lopez for your leadership on this topic. We're honored to partner with you today on today's important discussion. Thank you to the Alexandria Summit team and my co-founder, Joel Marcus, executive chairman and founder of Alexandria Real Estate Equities and Alexandria Venture Investments. And a big thank you to all of today's panelists and to everyone joining to listen, we're honored to be part of this community on the front lines of fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, in partnership with the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy, we come together once again in the midst of one of the most profound threats to public health in a century. Just this morning, there are ne nearly 4.3 million confirmed cases worldwide and over 290,000 deaths. In the United States alone, there's over 1.3 million confirmed cases and 82,000 deaths. As countries across Europe and states across America reopen for business, the community of stakeholders virtually gathered here today has an urgent call to action. And collectively, as we've discussed and we've seen, tremendous progress has been made in the war against COVID-19. The life science community have quickly mobilized to combat the impact of this pandemic, enabling new tests, clinical trials, and public-private partnerships that will drive solutions. As we've seen, COVID-19 may be here for a very long time and bringing with it a harsh new reality that will require tireless efforts to develop far superior and more readily scalable testing technologies, a persistent focus on prevention and screening, and therapies that will help patients at the highest risk as we all search and wait for vaccines that we hope will return us to the lives we once knew. So it's critical that we prepare to deal with a future marked with persistent disease. And in response, we collectively remain laser focused on advancing solutions. Together, we must leverage our powerful collective voice to drive how we navigate this crisis in both the near and the longer term so that we may ultimately return to a better new normal way of life. Together we'll get there, together we'll find solutions so everyone be safe, be well. We look forward to continued discussions and I'll turn it back to Mark for the final goodbye. Oh, I, no, no more final goodbyes, okay. that's enough goodbyes. Uh, and uh, until, we, goodbyes. until we meet again, for those of you who have not had enough yeah. of uh, Scott Gottlieb and me today, please tune in to the uh, House Oversight <laughs> hearing in uh, about 15 minutes. Thank you all and take Thank care. You.